Charlie. Amen. So um, I tell you what, let's get started here. I understand Brother Davis already came in and opened up with the word of prayer, so we appreciate that. I want to pick back up where we left off on last Wednesday because we were challenging the group <clears throat> last Wednesday on looking at how we can close a what we have found. And I'm going to tell you, it's been riding me about this, this 5% gap in people using their mind. And what we found is, is that there's people who have who are bound psychologically and just the simple task of asking them to think something through can be a challenge or to try something outside of the box that they've never tried before and don't even start talking about applying faith to it it becomes a challenge and then we took that information and we partnered it up with the fact that most of us that are in some level of public service and we mentioned the different sectors that we were talking about uh, if you're in a leadership role or you're in a role to where you have to administrate or facilitate things um, that you can find yourself becoming very very frustrated because you need people that will think first on a baseline level and then at least start the process of thinking outside the box and thinking next steps So I've been doing a lot of studying on this the past couple of weeks, and I found that there's a lot of gaps in how we think and what we believe um, true leadership is. And y'all have often heard me talk about um, this misconception that people have of the church and the role that leadership plays in the church. And we find ourselves doing more nurturing than we do leading. And I think I used an analogy a couple weeks ago of a person who likes to feed birds. I don't know if y'all remember that or not. Anybody ever fed pigeons before? Or seagulls? Y'all know what seagulls do. What do they do when they start coming, when you start feeding them? You just feed one and what happens? They all take off, right? And I compared that analogy to people that you often find in your life. And it's on both sides. Because you gotta remember something. There's always gonna be somebody to feed. But just because you feed them don't mean you're following. That makes sense? Remember this, one of the dynamic traps of leadership is to get stuck feeding with people who have no desire to go anywhere forward. Okay? So when you're building your teams, remember this, we're building apostolic and prophetic people that understand moving forward. Moving forward. Forwardness. Every individual, every house, every family, every single woman, every single mom for a while, every single male, every married couple, every single dynamic of leadership as it pertains to your life, there has to be a consistent vision that is moving forward. Jesus' vision always was a vision that moved forward towards that agenda. And I need y'all to get it in your spirit tonight that it is absolutely in the will of God for you to have a vision for your life. Amen? So I want to, we're going to teach that dynamic. Now, Brother Brisson, this is going to break up a lot of people's safe space. Because you got two dynamics. you got church leaders that think their job is just to feed and nurture and take off. They don't want no responsibility with leading or support leading the flock forward. Right? Or you have the same thing on your job. And you got to make certain that the leadership competencies that people have that you connect yourself with understand the significance of a kingdom of God vision. Any vision that becomes stagnant and all you're doing is feeding people, you're going to, out, you're going to outsource to the degree 
to where you're going to run out of supply. Amen? So we don't need no more fat Christians. <laughs> and I don't mean no disrespect when I make that statement. We don't need any more fat Christians. We need people that understand that you are a person of purpose. You are people of destiny. God have an assignment for your life. And the connection and the team that we're building is one that regardless of where you're at in your walk, we're moving forward. Amen? Don't want you guys getting stuck anywhere in the past. So you're going to find me a lot of times it's going to be kind of adverse because I'm going to challenge people. I'm going to challenge people that I find within leadership that find themselves getting sucked into feeding people and not leading them. I'm going to challenge that mindset. and I'm going to hit it head on because if not, it's, it can cripple the forwardness that you all have to have in your life. Amen? And so let's start looking at some of those things that we brought up um, last week that blessed me. And I think we were laughing. We went through them because it was like six different dynamics. I'm going to repeat them really quickly. Amen. I got a lot of smiles when we started going through them. And then we're going to break up the meat of the word of God, okay? The first one that we went over, we were talking about um, being able to start or get rid of the negative, repetitive thoughts in your mind, especially from a leadership perspective. The first one was to manage your workload. Y'all remember that from last week? Learn how to manage your workload. I was teasing a little bit, talking about that stack of papers on the desk. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And oh, oh, Ivy, uh, you probably just got homework right now, right? You don't have a lot of stack of papers on your desk for work. But how, many, how much more time do you got left in school? About a year or two? Okay, your day coming. I promise you, your day's coming. So you're getting it now. So you can learn that balance now, amen? And then the next one was manage the moment with neutrality. Manage the moment with neutrality. When I talk about that, you all are going to hear me as you begin to graduate from certain sessions. Um, in fact, one of the things that I want to endorse is just in a few weeks now, we're going to be having our emerging leaders session that is coming up on the first Monday. Y'all remember, this the first Monday of every month, emerging leaders come in the room. And one of the things y'all going to find me do is I'm going to challenge you all to be able to make a decision and table your emotions. Amen? You, gotta be able to, you, got, you cannot make a neutral decision and you are overwhelmed in emotion. Okay, anybody ever made a decision mad and realized later on down the road or maybe you weren't angry, maybe you felt sympathetic for somebody and made a decision and it was not the right decision. So we have to learn how to embrace how we feel, right? And then filter our feelings through the word of God before we make the decision to move left or to move right. I think we're good at this, Ryan. I think we're good. Yeah, to move left or to move right. So it's that, it's that peace that we got, and we want to make certain that when we're looking at the Word of God that we are filtering every thought through God's Word so that way we have not only an affirmation and a confirmation. Watch this, because we need affirmation. We need confirmation, but we also got to have confidence before we make a decision, okay? So commit to yourself tonight don't choose fast. Choose wise. Don't choose quickly. Choose wise. If there's a situation that's going to cause you to have to step forward away from what God right now is commissioning you to do, or if you're in a place right now where you don't know what in the world God is calling you to do, you just know that you're in a different place, that's okay. But don't make decisions that's going to pull you away from what you know God is calling you to do at this particular time in your life. Okay, so that's all a part of not getting sucked into an emotional decision that you have to pay for later. Okay, that's why the word teaches us in the book of Proverbs, he says to acknowledge God in our ways. <laughs> in that piece right there, Janae, it's not even talking about our thoughts, like it's about the ways that we have about ourselves. Acknowledge him in all of our ways. The ways is when I've thought about it, prayed about it, felt about it, not I've decided, but I need to make sure I'm acknowledging before I make this move on this. Amen? Sometimes God can give you something that he's commissioned you to do, but the timing for right now is off. So you want to be sure. You want to be certain. Um, feel free that when you're in those places to consult with people
who you believe know how to pray, or you believe you're consulting with people who you know um, know how to contact professional people that are skilled in those particular areas. The key is, is to not be afraid to surround yourself with the right people. Amen? Don't be afraid to surround yourself with the right people. And so then the next thing that we looked at as we were going through the session was practice big picture thinking. How many of y'all found that be hard to do sometimes? To practice big, I know I have, Brother Moore. To practice big picture thinking. That's why the word said practice it. Practice big picture thinking. Practicing big picture thinking is on the job training. Because that's a decision you got to make before you start thinking on any scale is to see the bigger picture. To see the bigger picture. I want y'all to get that in your spirit tonight as well. To be able to see the bigger picture. There's going to be things in your life that normally you would move on like right now. And it's probably, it could be agitating you. It could be an issue or problem that's causing a issue in your leadership. It could be an issue in your family. It could be an issue that's causing um, some pain in some of your support people. But before you move on that situation, take a step back and do what? See the big picture. Sometimes agitators can be a blessing to a big vision. You know what I mean by agitators? People that get on your nerves. You ever felt yourself saying, I don't know why they don't just get rid of them. I don't know why they keep putting up with them. But the senior leader won't move on those people right there. And you know sometimes why they won't move on those people right there? Because sometimes those people that agitate you are really whipping you into shape. Because sometimes we don't move how God tells us to move. We don't respond how God tells us to respond. We get real comfortable as Christians, especially when we're in a resourceful environment. We get complacent. So there'll be agitators that can be placed in your life that will get on your nerves so bad that you'll do the right thing. See, it takes a big picture thing to be able to see how the agitator is whipping the facilitator into shape. Amen? There are certain things in your life that if we would just do the right thing and be bold in who God called us to be, we would give no space for agitators to come in and create chaos. How many of you all used to struggle speaking up? You used to just take it and be, and be scared to speak up, scared to express yourself. How much trauma did that cause you? How many nights you go to bed wishing that you would open up your mouth and say something? How many times you went away feeling less than who God called you to be because you knew you could have fixed it or spoke up and didn't say anything? Then you got to ask yourself the question is why didn't I say something? What am I afraid of? Then you're going to go, when you get past that benchmark in your life, you're going to go through a season where you're too bold. Because now you chin checking everything on sight. It don't nothing stand a chance against you. I mean, oh, oh, I done broke through now. So now everybody getting it. So the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I've been there. The Holy Spirit would then start dealing with you because you start seeing the outcome of how you handle certain situations and then you realize you got to scale back. That's why the Word of God teaches us that wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is knowledge applied. It's never enough just to know it. That's why when people get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't release them in the ministry just right then. Because the Holy Spirit is going to do so much work in that person, and there's going to be so many things that's going to quicken and awaken in them. But just because they have the Holy Spirit does not mean they have learned how to live with him. So the discipleship piece, which realistically is the piece that most people who are just used to coming to church, they steer away from it because discipleship brings accountability. Discipleship brings accountability. And so what I've done with my life as a leader is I don't touch people who will not let me disciple them. I don't touch them. Now, I pray for them, but I don't touch them. And the reason I don't touch them is because I don't have time to waste. 
So I have to impart, right? I have to show wisdom. Because if I ever, you ever, get yourself in a position to where you overextend yourself, putting out all these little mini fires in your life, you will lose your vision, lose your mind, and you'll start pouring out of what God says you're supposed to keep for you, that reservoir of faith. Amen? So Apostle Robinson, I don't know how you keep going, how you keep going. I stopped years ago pouring out of my reservoir comes out my overflow. Because if I leave empty and have to go face those demons that I face every day, just like you got to go face yours, and you're on E, and your spirit is dry, and you're frustrated, and you're depressed, and you're down the dumps, and you're emotional, you'll use your natural skill to try to solution problems that God has anointed you by the Holy Spirit to be able to solution. And let me tell you something, you on your best day, as gifted as you are, as gifted as I am, can't match God's wisdom. So he keeps us in positions to where we have to be dependent on him to lead us and guide us to all truth. So I'll get accused of being mean, I'll get accused of not caring, I'll get accused of changing. I have, I'm not mean, but I've changed because I've been through those seasons of life where you try to lead from that perspective of just feeding people. And I'm going to tell you right now, pigeons will get fat on you. <laughs> Seagulls will eat until they pure teeth explode. But I promise you this, I bet you you can't go back to Myrtle Beach and identify the last pigeon or the last seagull that you fed. You know why? Because when you put that bread up, they left you. As soon as you closed the bread up, guess what they did? On to the next one. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you all some clues now to think about how you overextend yourself in life. Because the moment that you overextend yourself in life, you are shortchanging yourself someplace else. The word teaches, y'all okay? The word teaches that don't let your good be evil spoken of. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Be balanced. Be spirit-led. Trust in God. All egos get checked by the door. Emotions get tabled. That way we know the moves that we're making are moves that God is ordaining because ultimately what we want to see is God hand upon, God's hand upon the moves that we make. Sometimes he stretches blessings out for us because he needs us to work on patience. Anybody ever had something from him? You're like, God, you say it. Yeah, I said it. Now wait. And become disciplined. Wait. Put you a plan together. Wait. Save you some money. Wait. Put you a budget together. You see all that stuff? Because remember this. God did not let it rain in the garden until there was a man to steward it. Why would he not let it rain in a garden? What happens when it rains on? It grows, right? And what happens if nobody's stewarding it? It's a jungle. It's not a, it's not a garden anymore. It's what? It's a hot mess. It's a jungle. You got vines and weeds growing up everywhere. So up until that point, God said, I'm going to let things just saturate itself. I'm going to let it be self-sustaining. Because the Bible says that a mist came up from the earth, from the ground and kept the creation, what, fed. But it kept it fed just enough so it wasn't going to overgrowth. And a lot of times what we do is we want the blessing with no plan. We mad at God because, God, God, you didn't do what you said. You said, apostle prophesied it. Sister Buckley prophesied it. Brother Moore, he prophesied it. Pastor Brisson prayed over it. He said, wait a minute, now he did say that, and God is going to be a man of his word. But if God did it today, could you manage it? And are you prepared to manage it today? What plans have you put in place? You see what I mean? And so what God does is he holds us accountable to everything he deposits in our life. Make sense? Never go start a business and you've not counting the cost. Don't do that. Don't ever go out 
and just knee-jerk respond and just do something because it feels impulsive, it feels good, it feels like the right thing to do. God places us as stewards over his blessings. And that's a big thing when you become a leader because when we're becoming stewards over his blessings, God's blessings are people. That's why the Bible says that children are an inheritance from the Lord. Blessed is he whose quiver is full of them. You don't get to say these kids don't get on my nerves because you don't have none yet. Right? <laughs> these kids get on my nerves. You don't have any yet. But the Bible says that they're a blessing. They're an inheritance. Blessed is he whose quiver the quiver is that thing that Robin Hood held on his back every time he, he never ran out of arrows because the word teaches us that those children were to be arrows that you could expand and shoot and they would become keepers of the gates of the city. So even in parenting, right, even in parenting and our stewardship in parenting, most of that time is going to be spent nurturing but also cultivating and developing the child to become what God wants them to become. And if you miss that moment, you can't get that back. You can't get that minute back. So that's why it's important to invest in that child early. That's why the word says, and they grow old, the day will come, they won't, they won't depart from it. They'll come back to it. Some of y'all right now are counting on that to take place because you've made that decision in your life. Some of you right now are in that seating zone. You're in that vein in your life where you're making a deposit in those children. But if you know within yourself that you have, are, and will continue to make those word deposits and then be a demonstrative leader. See, being demonstrative is the most challenging part of your leadership journey. Because when you're demonstrating the kingdom of God, you're going to be surrounded by people who are going to question your integrity. They're going to question your validity. They're going to question your your qualifications. And see, when you deal with people who have uh, uh, less than faith and just write off hope, some of them are not even going to believe when they see you operating in that vein that God has commissioned you to. And you can't find yourself using that spiritual blessing that God has given you being driven just to prove them wrong. Because that will consume up every thought that God has given you on how you're going to flesh through the next journey. Proving somebody wrong is not the fuel for your next. Your faith is. Your faith is. God's divine purpose for your life is what's going to push you into your next. And the truth of the matter is, is everybody has failed somewhere. Everybody. I don't care where they're at now. If they're it, listen to me. If they're anywhere in life right now successful, they're failing somewhere. <laughs> Get that in your spirit right now. There's nobody around you on this planet that is not experiencing failure because failure is one of the primary stepping stones for exponential growth in your life. Failure is a part of your growth process. That's why y'all hear me say a lot of time on Sunday morning when I talk to the, the teams that are learning certain projects, and I was like, look, mess up here. Mess up here. Master it here. What are you doing? Why am I telling you to mess up here? Because I'm going to give you grace to get it right. We're going to correct you with admonition, with love and grace. You're going to learn how to do it the right way. So that way when you step into the marketplace, if you have soft feelings, if you have thin skin, if you can get biblical correction and learn how to receive it, when you step into an arena to where that admonishment can, may come another way, you're not going to respond with your ego. There you go. Or your emotions. You've already learned in church how to do what? Table your emotions and see what? The bigger picture. See, I need y'all to be seven steps ahead of your enemy. At least seven steps. I, I need y'all to be I need you to be seven steps ahead of them. And, and we got to come out of maintenance mode, cleaning up after we messed up, right? Cleaning up after we messed up. Cleaning up after we messed up. No, 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 no. There's going to be times where failure does not always leave the residue of failure behind it. Sometimes failure is a metric. 
Sometimes it's a number you didn't, make, you didn't get to. Sometimes failure is a response to a person that really looked up to you. And you, they caught you at a bad moment. And instead of you coaching them, you lashed at them. So you failed in that moment. But it does not identify you now as a failure. Why? Because you got space to go back and get this right. You only become a failure. See, and let me tell y'all something else about this thing, when I'm talking about this leadership piece and as it pertains to discipleship, because we've really got to fuse out the people who passively and ignorantly a lot of times nurture that spirit that people have where they don't want to have that accountability. Because I'm going to tell y'all something. Anywhere you go in your life that you want to grow in, you're going to have to have some level of accountability. Somebody's going to do checks and balances. Make sense? If, you, if you're married and you're a male and you're married to, a, to a, a, a real female, she's going to hold you accountable. <laughs> and vice versa. He's going to hold you accountable. Why? Because there's accountability in every healthy relationship. So a lot of times what we do when we look in the church world, we don't think that there should be any level of accountability there because we minimize the purpose of God's church. But I'm going to assure y'all something. I'm a church man. I'm a church states person. I'm a spokesman for God's church. I know that God's church is the launching plan for world-class leaders. I know the best leaders on this planet that are going to go into our doctor's offices, into our mental health fields, that are going to occupy a seat, in politics and government that are going to occupy and be some of the best entertainers that you find in theater or arts. I know for a fact that those people that are going to be trendsetters and change agents that are going to bring positivity and peace to this world are people that's coming out of God's church that are being dispatched out. Because the polar opposite of it is, is the ones who are not are always bringing some level of darkness and damnation to people's lives. So the church really has to grab a hold of its divine purpose and identify what God have us here for outside of the feeling of the service itself, right? It's got to be, what am I getting out of this, and how is it developing me as a person? And the blessing is, is when I look across this group, I can see that change. I can remember the first time I met each one of you, each one of you in here right now. I can remember the first time I met you. And I can see growth from day one to now. Now, the thing I need to ask you is this. Do you see that in yourself? You got to be able to see that in yourself. You got to be able to see where you're getting stronger. You got to be able to see where you're getting wiser. You got to be able to see where you're making better decisions. You have to be able to see where you're becoming more bold. You have to be able to see to where you're applying the word of God now and bringing it to your spirit. I said something in Sunday's lesson a reference to a prayer altar in home and the calls that came back by way of me about people saying, hey, I'm going to go do this. Man, that thing took my spirit. I was already hyped when I left out of here Sunday. I'm talking about I was on a thousand when I left out of this church Sunday. And I'm going to tell you what, Pastor Sheila came telling me about some of you that reached out and spoke to that. I'm like, God, thank you. Because I know you're getting it. And when you know that and you have those people that you know are eating that word and applying that word because they can see themselves in it, right, then that's when you know that those people are going to start manifesting fruit in their life. God has to do it because you're applying not just a principle, but you're doing it in his presence. There's where the power comes. That's where the consistency comes from. That's where the longevity comes from. That's where... The nation goes through a shortfall, but your business don't. Some of y'all are just now catching this, and you're starting, right? And it's tough to get traction now because you're just now starting it. But guess what? Them wheels going to start turning again. And when they turn this time, and we stay in his presence, and don't miss the purpose, and the outcome is not just money or recognition or things that anybody can get. Why would you settle for something that anybody can get? When you're so unique, when you're divine, when you're created by the hand of God, when he's got that much purpose in you. 
And I said it a few minutes ago, when you look back on your life and you can see, man, I have grown over the past seven years, over the past six months. Don't you forget that because the key is, is understanding why God assigned you to a place. See, the growth assignment, I don't know why y'all got me in this vein tonight. The growth assignment is going to go through stages to where you're going to get really uncomfortable. And you're going to get so uncomfortable in your growth process that you will start feeling disconnected. And what, <laughs> y'all hear me, what that is, is the word is challenging you. Everybody that comes to something left something. Amen? Everybody. Everybody that comes from somewhere else or comes to you in your life, there's something that they got away from, and there's a reason why they got away from it. What happens is in the process of growth is they forget why they left there. They forget. They forget God called them out of there and sent them someplace. And it totally loses their mind because, because they get consumed by the culture. So when the culture, listen to me, when God sends you through a season of your life to heal, take that season and heal. Don't feed in that season. Heal. Because what could have hurt you or what most of the time do hurt people and, and runs them out of regions is the demons that at some point in your life you'll have to go back and face them because you're going to meet them in church, you're going to meet them on your job, you're going to meet them in your family. You're going to meet those same spirits somewhere. And if that is what has been occupying and holding you back, you will find yourself on the run the rest of your life. Don't miss the why. When I'm doing leadership sessions, even with my leaders in the secular world or professional world, I'm always telling them, you got to understand the why. Why did God make that move? Why is God making you wait? Why is that child or that person responding the way they responded? There's always a reason why. Understand the why. That's where wisdom is applied. And when you understand the why, then you can commission yourself to do the what. But a lot of times we go and we do the what or what we can or what we feel and then after we've already committed and got our emotions entangled, then halfway through, oh, that's why. That's why Apostle didn't move on that. That's why Apostle backed up from there. Yeah, that's why, because I'm applying wisdom. You got to apply that same wisdom. And what will happen is that when you apply that wisdom, you will see wisdom applied and you will see increase after increase after increase after increase. This is why Jesus said, abide in me and my word will abide in you. And you can ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. He didn't say it shall be done. He said it's going to be done to you. So if I'm abiding in him, that means that the, the word abide there means to, to stay with, to live with. But it goes deeper than that, family. When you go back and you start studying the Greek transliteration, to abide means to become one with. It means to be converged into him. So he's saying, look, I'm, you abide in me, and my word is going to abide in you. Or abide in me and I in you is how he's writing to us. In other words, what he's saying is you become one with me in spirit and in mind. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something to you that's going to teach you how to bear much fruit. And then he says, you're fruit bearing as you bear fruit that this is how God's name is glorified because you are super producing in your life. That takes praise and worship off the stage, right? It takes it off the stage and, it, and it, we wipe the tears away and then we go engage in life. And when I'm producing in my life according to the way God commissioned me to, that's just like me standing in the church and lifting my hands up and saying hallelujah. He said, God's name is glorified when you become the product of his seed. I want you to think about that now, family. Think about that. So what are you doing right now that God can get glory out of? You don't have to answer that. I want you to think about it. Is the thing that you're tired of the thing that God wants to use to get glory out of you? <laughs> 
Is it? You got to ask yourself that question because if you've not, listen, if you've not given it your 100%, but you're something you told God or you know that God said go do it or sent you to it, and you're at 50% and you're ready to quit, you're at 50% and you're already questioning, then I can tell you right now, you hadn't even got past the blooming stage yet. He that had begun a work in you is able to perform it until the coming of the Lord. Let God do in you what he needs to do. Let God do in us what he needs to do in us so we can become consistent finishers. Amen? Somebody say consistent finisher. That's when you're going to be able to look back on your testimony and the glory to God and also the glory that's going to come to you as being able to complete a thing. You know what makes people doubt themselves? Is when they got too much unfinished business. Somebody shout, finish it. There you go, finish it. I don't care how hard it gets, finish it. Be consistent, be intentional, be a person of your word. Keep your word. Count your costs. You see that? Count your costs. There's going to be shortfall somewhere, but God have a way to ramp it back up. Man, I'm telling you. And when you start looking back and you start seeing the proof that you can accomplish this and you can get that done and you know the hardship that came along with it and then you can praise God through that consistency. Child, let me tell you something. Brother, let me tell you something. There's nothing that can stop you once you start walking by faith. Some of the most trying events of my life and some of the most successful times and moments of my life with God has been when people I was counting on walk. That has been some of the most empowering moments of my life because that pushed me to trust. Now, God, did you tell me this or did you not tell me this? Yes, I know you told me. I got, this, I got the praise, the footprints in the carpet to prove it when I was dancing and giving you praise when you told me that. So I'm not going to go back and tell you now you couldn't have told me that and it was just a feeling when I know God told me to go start this business. I know God told me to go back to school. I know he told me to do this, this, and this. He told you to do it. So God's going to provide wherever he guides. But he also tells us in his words that my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. And there's a reason for that because he sees the finished product. You know who the best big picture thinker is? God. <laughs> because God always sees the finished product. When's the last time you asked God, Lord, how do you see me finishing? I really want to praise him right now, but y'all have to be so calm while I teach this lesson to y'all. Have you asked God, how do you see me finishing? A lot of people won't ask God that. You know what? They're asking God, God, are you hearing me? God, are you sure? God, did I do something wrong? It's, I, I, everybody else gets blessed but me. Everybody else rides it out. And they're always doing it, but I'm the only one that, I'm always the one left looking and watching. Everybody else is finishing it. No, no, hold on a second. Ask God. He said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, for they be thoughts of peace, not of evil, to show you the expected end. How many of you all have been asking God to show you the expected end? And if he shows you, are you going to be okay with it? So it sounds to me like he's saying there's more that I require of you. Hey, what if the guy who buried his talent in the earth, if he'd have asked the, ta the master, show me the expected end? You think he would have ended up in prison? If he... <laughs> He said, I buried it because I saw you obtaining property and you didn't even work for it. Which in my mind, it tells me, Brother Moore, that's the level he's thinking on. Because if I find somebody that can get real estate and they're not putting no sweat equity in, I want to know their secret. I'm like, yo, show me what you're doing if it's legal. And then, <laughs> show me what you're doing legally to make these moves because I need to learn how to do this so I can start setting up my family. So, so now let's deal with perspective. It's going to take us to 
I always start wrapping this up. Amen. Um, I want you to uh, grab this passage here because I sincerely believe that the taxes that we've been teaching you all will be beneficial to whoever consistently puts them into practice on a regular basis. While these practical, tactical um, action items may be profitable for individuals and those they're connected to, remember these are mental practices that I was talking about earlier, like um, practice big picture thinking, engaging in life gazing, strive to elevate awareness. Those are all practical, psychological practices that are good for you to put into practice to help train your mind. But the other side of it is the spiritual aspect. And I was dealing with a part of that as I was ministering to you all um, because we don't want to deal with just the psychological piece and then don't bring forth the renewal of the mind. And so the part that we have to deal with a lot of times, brothers and sisters, is that part of and a key component of our salvation, of us being born again believers, is that God gives us the opportunity to have our minds renewed and transformed. And I want that to be a priority. That's one of the things that we have on our prayer list. <sighs> Listen to me. As a leader in your life, whether you're leading children, business, your professional job, wherever you're at, ask the Lord if the people who are surrounding you and that you're depending on helping to facilitate your vision, if these are people of faith, and they're Christians, has their mind been renewed? Now, this isn't something that you might need to sit down and have breakfast with them over. This is you dealing with them from a leadership perspective and a perspective of oversight, and you're watching the behaviors. Anybody ever got frustrated watching people's behaviors? <laughs> she said, mm-hmm. I, I have found myself as a leader, and again, I started in official in leadership back in 95, 96. So I've been doing this a long time, running these distribution centers, and that's not even including the ministry side that I did in the other faith I was in versus the Christian faith. It's all leadership, y'all. When it comes to dealing with people who just don't get it, Anybody have, ever had to deal with somebody? They, you just, you done trained them, you done told them, you done fussed at them, you done fired them and then hired them back, you know, you done went off on them, you just done, just got to the point, you're like, I don't know what else to do to get you to start thinking forward and making some decisions without having to repeat the same questions, right? There's something going on there. I don't want you to get, I don't want you to be embarrassed. I want you to be able to acknowledge there's something going on here. So what's going on? What would make a person, after you have trained them and developed them, continue on as if you didn't? So are you listening up there? <laughs> Pastor Davis, you got me back there? What would make a person do that? There's something going on here, especially if you know the person's character. I'm not talking about a person that's just rebellious and belligerent, doesn't care. If you're in the workforce or in ministry, you need to be bold enough to get those people out of position, period. No questions asked. Go through the process. Give the verbal, give the admonition, do checks and balances, retrain if you need to, step back up, inspect what you expect. If they're not in the place to where they're flowing in that thing, they're the wrong person for that job, to the wrong person for that ministerial responsibility, have a real life adult conversation with that person and let them know we can remove you. We don't do that in church, Brother Brissom. You know why? Because we're afraid of offending them. We're afraid the whole family's going to leave. <laughs> I don't want to get offended and leave the church. Okay, if they leave the church, they're going to leave the church. It, it's, it's not that you want them to. But you never compromise yourself as a leader because you're afraid of how somebody's going to respond. You okay, Brother Black? You got to be bold and humble at the same time. Because here's the deal. If God puts you to be responsible over people, to lead people, 
Do you realize that you have to give an account for God first on how you led them as opposed to wondering about how they responded to your leadership? We live in a world right now that wants Sister Georgia Buckley to be thankful that her staff showed up for work. Now, she should be thankful that her staff showed up for work because she's going to have a heck of a day if she goes in there and she's, uh, there ain't but two people in there. She's been through days like that, right? Well, it was just her. She, boom, boom, running all over the place, seeing the, seeing the um, patient, checking them in at the front desk, in processing them in, checking their weight, filling out the flow chart. I didn't see her in action. She's like the Energizer Bunny, right? What y'all don't see is after she's done all everybody else's job, her workload is still sitting on her desk at the end of the day because she didn't get to touch anything that she was supposed to touch as the CEO and owner of that business. She has daily documents that have to be reported up to the state, probably to the federal government, to her patients, checks and balances. She's got to be able to overview and see how her budget is, is landing. She's got to check her investment. She's got to check in with her accounting department. Everything that helps to facilitate that business that people don't see and they think that all she does is check blood pressure and give medicine out when people are sick and write prescriptions. If it was just that easy, anybody could do it. But anybody can't do what she does. I, I need people to understand that. She's anointed to do what she does because if anybody could do what she does, guess what? She'd be doing something more dynamic. There's a reason why she's in the position that she's in. So what happens with the people that surround her, I'm just using her because she's a business owner, with the people that surround her, they've got to lock in on when she's not leading and identify when she's feeding. Y'all okay? There's two different groups of people in the business that she runs that she's supposed to feed. Her patients and her leadership. And her patients will receive more from her in person than her leadership group does. But if the leadership that surrounds the CEO expects her to feed them more than she feeds her patients, guess what's going to get impacted? Her bottom line is going to get impacted because they're going to expect her to feed everybody. And I'm just going to watch her be just a wonderful person. And she's so nice. And I love working with her. And she don't never get mad. And when she does get mad, everybody gets quiet. And we're going to apologize and get her a cake and make her feel better about her day. And tell her we're going to do a CEO appreciation day. We just love you. We know we love you. And thank you for loving our mediocrity. Hmm. I'm just as prophetic and comedic as I can be, but I know, I know people and I know leadership. Y'all want me to come to y'all house? Who else want me? Want me to pick another job? I've been doing this a long time on the spiritual side and the professional side. There ain't a lot that's getting past me at this point. Why do people backfill roles of leadership but will not lead? Why do people be in administrative roles, but they will not administrate? There's a reason why they need the same prayer every single week. It goes back to the Word of God that I'm teaching you all, and it deals directly with be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good an acceptable will. Some, some pastors say perfect, don't it? Acceptable will of God. <clears throat> when we exercise the right to receive the benefit of a transformed mind, we will think on the God level. And what gets most people in trouble in their life is they get born again, they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we become these great people, but we don't know how to think. So we find ourselves always begging God to do something. When as a child of God, you should never have to beg for anything. No more than I'm going to let my knee baby here beg me for something. She hates when I call her that, but she's still my knee baby. 
She's not going to beg me for nothing. I'm her daddy. I'm her dad. I'm a father. How's she going to beg me? It's not going to happen. But as a dad, I'm going to have expectation. I'm going to have accountability. I'm going to call her on the carpet. I'm going to ask questions. <laughs> and watch this. I'm going to do all those things, right? But I'm going to love her unconditionally. So why do we confuse accountability with a person that don't love us? Yeah, we got to eat this. You know what happens with people? Let me help you all with something. I'm going to help lift your spirit right quick. See, this is what happens when people get rejected. When people go through chronic rejection, when you go through a bad divorce, you go through a bad relationship, when you go to a ministry that really tore your mind up, when you've been bullied in school, when you've always felt like you were less than, when you've always been on the backside, you were never picked first, you were always picked second, when you've always been in a position to where you felt like you didn't level set and measure up, your carnal mind, your natural mind wants to shift to think that nurturing people and enabling people to continue on in those behaviors is going to help you get past this rut that you face of having to deal with the spirit of rejection. You see what I'm saying? Because we, don't, we do not want to find ourselves in a position where people don't like us. So when people walk in boldness, the person who is operating in fear of rejection, they think that those people on the other side who's been delivered from that, they just don't care about people. They're heartless. That's not the case. See, we love people enough to tell them no. <laughs> we love people enough to hold them accountable. We love people hold, hold enough to correct them and to admonish them because we would rather them not get in the ditch than to get credit for pulling them out. And that's what happens in church so many times and in leadership and on your job. I want the credit subconsciously for pulling you out of this hole because I have a need to be accepted and a need to be needed. But you'll never leave a person out of a wilderness mindset with fear of rejection. I've taught y'all for years that the, this, the, the crazy part about the wilderness, brother and sister Moore, is that God will sustain you in the wilderness. Your sandals will not wear out. You will never go hungry. You'll always have some place to put your head, but the conditions around you will not change. It's always going to be a wilderness. When you live in the wilderness and you're being sustained in the wilderness, your mind adapts to a hostile environment. And murmuring and complaining becomes your communication registry. So by the time you get an opportunity to look at something bigger and better, when you step into the land and you see, hold on a second, there's giants in the land. Canaan? <laughs> Look a little bit. There's giants in the land. They come back with evidence in the book of, uh, I think it's Numbers. And they come back with the evidence after they spied out Canaan. And the Bible says that they had grapes, right? Grapes it, on the orchard that was the size of apples. And they're coming back with this huge fruit, and they see these huge houses and they see these humongous neighborhoods, and the Israelites looked at the sons of Anak, who were giants, and said, we can't go there because we look like grasshoppers to those people. Now remember this, God sent them there. He said, I want you to go into a place, and you're going to occupy land, watch this, where giants built your neighborhood. Everything is supersized. But I'm telling you, grasshopper, you get ready to go, grasshopper, and occupy a giant house. But we can't see it because we're so used to being in the wilderness, and there's no way somebody who's been in the wilderness their whole life can ever become a CEO of a major corporation, can ever own their own practice and become a multi-millionaire overnight, can ever become a homeowner, can ever become a good mom or a good dad, can ever launch a successful business, can ever lead a successful business. There's no way because we've been in the wilderness our whole life and God sustained us through the wilderness of so the same God today as he was yesterday. He's going to be the same God forevermore and I'm going to stay mad and saved. <laughs> 
I'm going to stay frustrated and say, no, God have a promised land for you. And the Holy Spirit in you, the Christ in you, the hope of glory, is what will bring the manifestation of that seed he put in you out of you. Amen? So I want y'all to sit on that tonight. I want y'all to just sit on that word tonight. I want you to get this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. There's certain things he didn't even address. He's being attacked. He said not a word. That don't make you weak. It just means you know, I'm not even going to reduce myself to somebody that I've already got authority over. Why are you fighting people that you already got authority over? Why are you fighting battles and you're already in charge? You're already in command. They can't even move you out of your position, but you're arguing your integrity with them. You're arguing your space. You're arguing your headspace with them. You're giving up time that you should be processing life. And God has already elevated you above these people. He's pulled you out. Remember what we've been reading? He said, I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to pull you out from amongst the heathen. Then I'm going to place you in your own land. Then I'm going to give you a new heart. And after I give you a new heart, then I'm going to put my spirit in you. And then after I put my spirit in you, I'm going to teach you to walk by my ways. He's setting us up for surgery, I'm telling you. He set us up to be made whole. Because at the end of the day, God has put too much in you to let it all go to waste over somebody who can't recognize the gift that you are. And some of you might be watching at home tonight and you ain't realize it yet because you're dependent on somebody, you depended on somebody to confirm that in you. Okay, she left you. Okay, she walked away. Okay, he, 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 dropped, the, he dropped all responsibility and left you holding the bag and halfway deals with the children. That's his problem, not yours. And don't you start specializing and letting other people's problems become your problem that you carry every day. Amen? Let them miss it. You don't miss it. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. Because I'm going to tell you something. God has already prepared himself for you to fall short. And he's already got his hand waiting on you. He said, a just person going to fall seven times. I've already got my hand waiting on you so that when you fall, I'm not going to let you fall. You're going to fall, but you won't fail. I'm going to lift you right back on up, dust you off, send you back out there, and I'm going to say, go your way and don't you mess up like that no more. Amen? I hope tonight that you got something from this lesson. I felt compelled to minister to you as opposed to teach a Bible lesson because I felt like your spirits are at a place where y'all got some decisions you got to make about you. Not about them, about the house, about everything. I got to look at me and look at how I see life. And so Sunday morning, we're going to pick up this thing about seeing life through a biblical worldview. Because that's the lens that we got to see everything through to help to shape and mold our minds. And I'm going to give you the presence of God. We'll get that through our corporate worship, the principles of the kingdom of God. And then we're going to learn how to apply them, right? And then we're going to send ourselves away with some home. So today's homework, once again, is if you got anything from tonight's lesson, do you feel like that 5% margin at least went to 10 today? I can think now outside the box. I can think a little further. I can, how many of you think you can learn how to, or you're willing to take this week and start focusing on tabling your emotions? Can that be some homework this week for somebody? I'm going to table my emotions. I'm not going to respond based off of this feeling I have. I'm going to use my truth filter. Your wisdom, there you go. I'm going to put it, I'm going to table this feeling. And I'm going to start counting my costs. If you helped somebody last week to get through that homework, this week, this week I want you to identify somebody who's in your circle, right? Who you keep seeing blowing it every week. Maybe they're losing their temper. Maybe they're impatient. Maybe they're in a room having a conversation. They got a bad habit of cutting people off. Anybody been in that room before? You talking and the person, you they just keep cutting you off. You're, you're trying to get a point across. They just, but, 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 yeah, but, 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 but. And you'd be like, if you don't stop cutting me off, get my word out. But, 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 shaking the head. And you can imagine all the words in their spirit while they're doing that. 
Who are you going to help this week? Find somebody to make a deposit in and help them to start renewing their mind in Christ Jesus. So may call you and ask you to pray with them. Ask them a few questions before you pray. Have you? Why did you? Where are you at? How many times have you heard this? What is your expectation to come out of this prayer? I just need strength. For what? You ask me to pray for you, I got a right to ask you. Amen? Huh? I need strength to beat him up. God, give me strength to knock him out. <laughs> Table that emotion, girl. Table that emotion. Call your daddy. Let's pray first. <laughs> amen. Amen, amen, and amen again. I believe this is going to be a dynamic week for y'all. Keep me in prayer. Keep Pastor Sheila in prayer. She's resting tonight. Um, and I asked her to rest tonight. She, she is tired. I need to get her. I need to keep Mama restored. So um, she'll be up and ready to rock and roll in a couple days. So I need to make sure she's, that she's up and strengthened. So keep her in prayer. Keep the Boykin family in prayer. Um, it's on my heart to strengthen this Wednesday night. It's on my heart to strengthen this Wednesday night. I believe that these Wednesday nights are going to get some stuff out that you don't get on Sunday mornings. So let's start praying about what we can do to strengthen. Let's get some folk to come out. Um, I'm glad to see y'all. Glad to see y'all here. Um, but let's, let's, start, let's start gathering on Wednesday um, and uh, get prepared for these new series that are going to be launched up, okay? If y'all saw the Facebook post earlier, I was with, me and Pastor Sheila was on the property today, and they're, they're grading now. They're grading, so I found out they got to put almost three and a half feet of dirt graded so that when they put the latest slab, Pastor Brissom, that the water from the road don't go down into the building. So they got stakes up that are marked, and there's that much flat dirt I'm talking about that's got to go to, before they can lay that concrete slab. So, um, And then I got out there, and one of my apostle friends is out there on the backhoe and on the grader, so... Now we know we got born again contractors out there, spirit field contractors out there working on the property. So I got excited when I seen that because I know these guys personally and I know them to be kingdom professionals. So um, let's, no, no bootleg work going into our building. So I'm very glad, glad for that. We ought to give God praise for that. Amen. All right, let us pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we bless you. Thank you, Lord God, for this, this word that you gave us. I feel like tonight we had a conversation. I feel like we just... We just shared, and Lord, we'll take that as a blessing from you. We pray that the word penetrate the heart. May the wisdom that you gave us tonight penetrate our hearts. If it's patience we need, let it have its perfect work. If it's wisdom we need, Lord, we ask for you, and you said that you would give us to us liberally. If it's strategy that we need, God, you told us in your word that you would give us a right answer if we worshiped you. Whatever it is that we need tonight, Lord, we know that you have it, and that as long as we are abiding in you, the answer is also in us or in someone who's connected to us. We pray tonight, Lord, that as you, we exercise patience, that we see the big picture, that we practice that big picture thinking, that we see as Jesus sees. We pray, God, also for those that we connect to in us as well, that we receive transformation in our mind and renewal. We're no longer thinking like wilderness people, but we are blessed in you, and we thank you for it right now. We give your name praise and glory and honor. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's give God a good praise for, for everybody. Amen? Amen. Amen and amen again. Sister Soraya, are we off on the video now? Are we off? Give me two seconds. I want to ask y'all to pray for something for me.